Hello and welcome to the GAS 2020 virtual conference. My name is Rod Morris and I'm here to present my film Closer. The film documents an innovative new project led by glass artist and curator Matt Duran. When I started this project I had no idea of what was coming and I had no idea how relevant the the, the subject of the film would come to be. It was a really exciting way of connecting people on one side of the world, artists and scientists, with the makers in a factory in Sweden on the other side of the world. Maya, who, um, <clears throat> who contacted Matt about setting up this project, she'd seen the devastation caused by the collapse of the industry and she wanted to try and find some way to reignite production in this area and uh, she was reaching out in lots of ways to lots of different people and one of the people she reached out to was Matt Duran and he's full of ideas and um, one of his ideas was to utilize uh, increasing uh, broadband speed to uh, allow people to kind of communicate with each other but not necessarily be in the same room. And this is an idea that's really come of age during this crisis. So it's, it's none of us realized how pertinent this, the subject of this film was gonna be until we'd made it. And now here we are, and it's great to have something that responds to the virus and to the, to the emergency straight away. So I hope you enjoy the film and that it contributes to the debate about how we are going to continue to work together following this terrible situation and about how there may be some positive impact as a result of those changes. If the craft does not take up the possibilities offered by science and art, it will just be a pittoresque, nostalgic show for some tourists. And that's not what I want for the craft. I'm Maya and I'm the museum director of the Glass Factory. I've been associated with the museum 10 years. It was all in ruins, you know, the Kingdom of Crystal is going through a kind of a change, of course, because the industry is changing and disappearing. Uh, so we had to start anew. So the municipality bought the glass collection of Orefosh Kustaboda, which is our core, and then they wanted to start a museum that should finance itself, by itself almost. So that was the big, the big uh, challenge we had. 
So we are in Boda, in the Kingdom of Crystal, in the lowlands of Sweden. And uh, we're here because glass is ever more being made remotely. And we have set up a project that connects through live streaming uh, makers, artists and makers who work in glass with the science and medical research world. In medical and scientific research, you need some creatives there. You, you need people who understand process and materials and the applications of those materials and what's possible. With new digital crafts, we can really look towards building up a future of glass making. Hello, I'm Shelley James and I'm an artist and I'm working with Professor Brian Sutton and the team here at the Glass Factory on this amazing project called Glass Hack. So what we're trying to do is to create something which has both the organic quality that hot glass brings but also is regular enough to pack into an array which suggests the way that these hair cells are packed in the ear. So working with some wonderful um, young people who work in the Fab Lab normally, what I've done is ask them to create um, moulds and models which allow us to create perfectly regular um, arrays of hair cells. So we're blowing stringers and then pressing them through here and then adding that to the end of the cell and you'll, you'll see us making some of those. Um, so I'm trying to bring the microscope and the home because I mean we all remember when we were small and had a microscope at home and just looked through it and were super, super fascinated by all the structures underneath. But it's, it is what it is. It's usually when you have it as a kid plastic or when you're working with it as a professional, it's metal and super heavy. But I actually want to bring it to the home and project the image to the wall, basically like a, like an image. So it's, and while it's off, it should look like a nice home accessory. And that's why glass is a perfect match part with the lenses, with uh, the light underneath. Now I'm making the outsides, basically, like what you will see, uh, when it's off and on, and then all the inside, the technical stuff, will be solved afterwards. And our initial idea was, let's get the scientists to come and work with the artists in the hot shop. But then we realised that actually, this is, this is very difficult. Everyone has very little time. It's a way to travel here. Then we decided that the best way to facilitate that is to live stream between the scientists and, and the makers. And we just thought this was a very progressive idea they can see what's being made. They can make the alteration in the moment. And then it really allows us to build on this relationship. We can build a language, a common language. We have a deeper understanding of what they do, and they have a deeper understanding of what's possible in glass. Brian and I spent some time calculating the, w the wavelength of audible frequencies that are going to be passing through water. And so we asked the team here to create some boards with nails poked through them, a space at a particular frequency which is likely to create these secondary wave effects that we're interested in, these constructive and destructive interference patterns. I think the technology has had its glitches, but we're in the very early stages and I think we're pushing at the edges of what it can do. So one of the reasons, one of the problems has been the delay and so we're not really talking in real time, but that's because of the number of staging posts that are happening in the signal. And I think over time, we're going to get closer and closer to a real live conversation. To create something which is actually designed to break was kind of intriguing and great fun and slightly scary for the people around me because in the final performance we set up the hair cells and made them jiggle to the point where they all broke and that was that was great fun um, and what was really fascinating was the audience response to that performance because in the past I've often worked with individual objects but this suddenly became something quite different and that was very exciting. So it's, yeah, it's different parts, it's the workshops and the live making, it's uh, the trying out of course and it's also the lectures. So we have the, um, we had uh, Jane Cook, 
Dr. Jane Cook from Corning, who gave a fantastic lecture about Corning and the residencies, the new audit residencies they have since 2014. We had Jerry Lachlan from the Material Library. That, that was fantastic. All the artists loved it because that was like the foundation for everything we do and uh, she went in with her whole body. We have John's fantastic lecture, human, human geography and, and, you know, and, and how he, he connected to the artists in such a way, so they came to him and, and thanked him for you know, changing their lives. So we have all these beautiful uh, lectures. Matthias Rang and uh, Nora Lerbe talking about color from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's uh, color teachings from the, from the 18th century. So their point of departure is really historical and, and working with that in class. Of course, Shelley, Shelley James uh, talking. So, so the lectures were fantastic and I would say life-changing actually because things are, that have never been done in Sweden. And uh, so we have also a lot of young people in the Hotshop, as you can see, which is good, who really enjoy it. And they hang out for three days every day, eight, nine hours uh, to just sit there and watch. Yes, I'm Jane Cook, Dr. Jane Cook. I'm the chief scientist at the Corning Museum of Glass. Glass, is, uh, glass can be very different from place to place. Uh, it, we, we, we think about glass as being this sort of ubiquitous thing that uh, it must all be roughly the same because it's all doing roughly the same thing in the world. Uh, but in the reality, uh, very subtle differences in the way that it's been put together, the formulas, the recipes, and then the, the furnaces that it's melted in, lend a certain different qualities to it that are important when you're working it by hand or by machine. Philosophically, that's how, that's how glass works. Um, you learn very early as a, as a glass engineer and as a glass artist that glass is willful. It has things that it wants to do and does very well. And the way that you learn how to work it is learn how to work with it. And so when, when creators embrace the idea that there's going to be failure and trial and experimentation, uh, the, what comes out ultimately is going to be much richer, better directed, a fuller experience and a longer lasting experience. Uh, so I think th there's, there's a wonderful meta synergy going on here that they're coming up with a way to explore with glass, but they're actually applying methodologies, philosophies that are in themselves the type of exploratory things that you would want to do with any materials. I love that. Coming to, uh, I mean, the heart of the Crystal Kingdom, coming to this place where so much beautiful glass has been made for centuries, and seeing it in such a derelict state, it's very sad. Uh, we have a, we're staying in a hostel in a renovated uh, schoolhouse where there are no children. Uh, walking a, a five minute walk each day over to the factory, to the museum space, past houses that haven't been occupied for decades, overgrown. Um, and then you come into the space and it's, it's vibrant, it's alive. And, but the, the sadness is tempered, I think, by the the passion of the people here at the glass factory that are they clearly believe in glass i'm peter kashinke i'm a german glass blower who learned his trade in both sweden and italy and has traveled in europe educating developing glass craft for about the last 20 years. Um, my role in the factory is supposed to be a glass blower in all the projects we run, but also the creative leader, the art director of the place. There's always a challenge in uh, just understanding the idea of um, an artist, a scientist who wants you to make a program. That's the real challenge. And then, of course, there's always these small challenges. Can I get the bowl to have nine perfect spikes in between? And what type of tool do I need? And um, the whole process, until you understand that's the way to do it, is what is really interesting and challenging at the same time. But I like challenges. 
fantastic to have this modern type of double communication. But always, in the end, it's a big difference to have somebody in person in front of you. And that what has been really nice. I mean, we both have had contact through the internet, but we have had the, 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 the persons to come here and the people involved to be not only in a working situation, but also meeting each other and talking about private things. The thing, the, the really good thing that we all love about this place, uh, because this is about placemaking, is that it's in the middle of the forest. Originally started, you know, as a, as a glass factory in 1864 as Boda Glass Works, uh, situated in the middle of pretty much nowhere with all the trees. It's an integral part of what we are, you know, this place. And we call it our little Twin Peaks, actually. Uh, because this is why all the glass houses started, because of the trees, you know, because of the, the wood for the furnaces. And it still shapes us very much today, you know. So. My name is John Sunderland. I'm a landscape specialist. Um, my background is in archaeology and it's also in art. I came uh, to undertake an artist's residency and my idea was to look at the abandoned buildings around Boda in the context of the end of industrial glass production. And what kind of signs are there of the past activities in these buildings? What do they tell us about Boda? And I, I was fascinated really but I didn't know quite what I was letting myself in for, really. When I came here first, I was fascinated by the forest. I walked around the forest and I got this sense of darkness in the forest. And I felt there was some sort of correlation in myself with that kind of darkness. So in a way, the abandoned buildings seem to be a very appropriate fix for that because the abandoned buildings are something material, a material culture that I could actually investigate, that I could get into, something that, that, was, that was concrete rather than, than an abstract idea. Somewhere where I knew you were going to get signs of change. And the stove has been ripped out. 
kind of interesting. There's this sort of a couple of pills on the stove. Strange. Fireplace is gone. But the upstairs this is another place. You get this sort of it's more private space than the downstairs of building. It's where people slept, it's where they had sex, it's where they gave birth even. But this, in here I found a newspaper, and the newspaper was from 1971, and it was a Greek newspaper. I thought, well, that's really interesting, because I think it does indicate that, the, and back up the, the information that I gather, that there were, in the 1970s, there were quite a lot of uh, Greek glass wor workers coming and working in Boda. So it's very possible that um, a Greek family lived in this, in this building. There, I, I just... In Skadang. Oh, yes. July 1919. I, I think there's this sense of hiatus, a sense of vulnerability and um, uncertainty about the future of a place like this, like many places that go through this change from, from, from a large-scale industrial production to something else. And what that something else is always brings with, with it a sense of unease about the future. So, so these places, not only are they buildings, but they're also a society. And then the, the society is going to change. Um, people will move away and other people will move in. Je suis Jonas Delay, artiste plasticien, j'habite en France. C'est toujours intéressant de pouvoir euh, accéder à des espaces comme ça qui ne nous, qui nous sont pas forcément familiers. Ici c'est le, le verre, moi je suis artiste plasticien, donc pas forcément souffleur de verre. Donc forcément d'avoir la possibilité d'accéder à une technique et à, une, à un mode de pensée différent avec une matière particulière. C'est toujours intéressant, même si ça peut, être, ça peut troubler la manière dont on, a, dont on a de faire les choses ou de penser les projets. Mais c'est vraiment l'idée d'une collaboration euh, dans, pour amener à la finalité de la pièce qui, qui est assez intéressante. On peut considérer le verre comme étant une matière qui, qui est ancestrale, dont les pratiques sont, sont millénaires, etc. Et c'est vrai qu'on voit dans, on a vu, on voit encore dans l'industrie euh, un changement radical euh, où finalement on était dans l'idée dans de la production. Et ici, cette, euh, cette usine, cette factory a, a, parle aussi sans doute de cette histoire, d'une forme de mutation. Et euh, je pense que d'une certaine manière, c'est un bon exemple ici de, de renouvellement et de voir comment le verre peut évoluer dans le futur parce qu'ils euh, ont su, d'une certaine manière, retrouver un espace de production et de recherche, et en passant par, euh, justement, cette idée de la collaboration avec des artistes, avec des scientifiques, avec des designers, et finalement, d'allier une forme de production avec une forme de recherche et euh, de bienveillance pour, euh, pour justement, être, euh, être au service à la fois du verre et aussi des, des idées qui peuvent être développées dans ce matériau. This has been the most amazing opportunity to develop my research in conversation with scientists and to be here with such an extraordinary, supportive and talented team, both in, in the hot shop and the support really behind the scenes to both make sure that we're welcome and comfortable, but also that all the technology works. I know that the scientists have really relished the chance to see how their ideas can be expressed through glass and to learn some new things themselves from that. Both Andrea Strait and Brian Sutton have both been amazed and delighted and impressed by what can be done when we all work together in this way and 
Andrea was able to come, but Brian has been working at a distance and I think he's got a lot out of it and I think we both learnt a lot and we're looking forward to developing our ideas together more. In my, in my visionary uh, idea, this is the place in Sweden where intangible cultural heritage, which is nothing else than living persons who execute craft, really come together, save the craft by developing it in a modern world. People say, are you worried about glass? Are you worried about um, what's happening with glass? I never worry about glass because we really don't really fully understand it as a material and there's so much potential with the material and we're, we're making new discoveries. Glass that was discovered 20, 30 years ago is now becoming more and more relevant. So it's, it's just showing and demonstrating what's possible. How can we link together all over the world, and the internet allows us, and live streaming allows us to do that. And, um, and, and let's just try and find ways where we can be facilitators. I think artists can be great facilitators. 